Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. It's great to be with you guys in this latest episode of a YouTube live here. We'll put this on podcast app afterwards, but welcome back to the podcast. I will be keeping my eye on the chat for any folks that tune in while we're doing this live. And I will be answering questions if folks have them or interacting with the chat. So be sure to be interacting in the chat if you're watching live right now. Today, there's a lot to cover. We're going to do a quick roundup of some of the breaking news stories that are really taking the internet by storm right now, but that are really important for us to look at because, of course, abortion is in the news right now in a big way, and I want to talk about why that is and what's being talked about. Also, Ted Cruz and the Democrats are battling over an IVF bill, a pair of competing IVF bills right now in Congress. So we're going to talk about that as well. But I want to start by deep diving the tragic story of Amber Thurman. Now, some of you might not have heard this name before. This is the first time you're hearing Amber's name, but that's because this is a brand new story that is broken in just the last few days that is being relentlessly pushed by pro-abortion media sources and even by Vice President Kamala Harris herself right now for justification for abortion on demand. So we're going to unpack what actually happened in this tragic case, why the media narrative and Kamala Harris's narrative on this is an outright lie, and why the story of what happened to Amber is the reason why we actually need abortion to be banned. We need to stop the lethal killing of children. We need to protect the women that are being preyed upon by the abortion industry. So we're going to unpack all of that and more. So again, hello. Hey, Caleb. Um, the chat's starting on here. Hello, Brooke. Um, thanks for joining. Yes, there's a lot to unpack, and we are going to be unpacking the Amber Thurman story. All right. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone listening to the show. The show's really been growing by leaps and bounds. Thank you. Thank thank because of you. I'm thankful to you for making that happen. The listener, our listener group is continuing to grow. We have an incredible community that we're building over at Locals. You can go check out Locals at the link in the description. But our Locals community is where we are sharing special behind the scenes access, um, you know, things that I'm starting to write and share there, special video content. We're also going to be releasing some new products soon, which I'm really excited about some of which will be exclusively exclusively available to our Locals uh, crowd. So go check out Locals at the link in the description. I also need to shout out some of our sponsors for today's episode. A big shout out to We Heart Nutrition. We Heart Nutrition is a pro-life company with top of the line vitamin supplements. I love We Heart Nutrition because this is an American family business that uses the highest quality ingredients to get you the best nutrients for your body. I love that they actually tailor all of their products to specifically serve women at different stages in their life, whether it's the everyday vitamin package for women, or if you're a prenatal to help you be the healthiest you for your baby or your postnatal, they have packages for women who are postnatal. We Heart Nutrition has packages packages for menopausal women and postmenopausal women. So they really have it have everybody covered, but I love that We Heart Nutrition is really dedicated to the highest quality uh, ingredients, the highest standards for the product that they make. Again, 100% made in the USA and sourced here in the USA. And this is a family-run business with a small family that is passionately pro-life. So weheartnutrition.com actually gives 10% of their revenue to pregnancy resource centers and supports the pro-life movement. I absolutely love this business model. You know that I'm excited about this on the podcast because it's supporting the growing pro-life movement. And so you can get the best top of the line vitamins and supplements from weheartnutrition.com. And if you go there today, weheartnutrition.com, use the code Lila at checkout, you'll get a full 20% off your order. That's weheartnutrition.com. Go check them out. They're amazing. All right, let's go to the Amanda Thurman story. I saw this headline and I immediately knew something was up because the reality is since the overturning of Roe v. Wade over two years ago now, the pro-abortion side has been desperate to push a narrative that abortion is necessary for women, that it's essential for our health care, that we need it, and that without abortion, women are going to die. Of course, they don't talk about the 1 million babies that are dying from abortion every single year in America, that's, a, that's ignored. 
by these media reports, but they zero in on these really tragic cases of women who are experiencing miscarriage or women who are experiencing maybe a life-threatening emergency. And then these media groups, these very pro-abortion ones, not all of them, but several of them, many of them, are really focused on claiming that it is pro-life laws that are putting women at risk. This is a flat out lie. We debunked the Kate Cox case on the podcast before. We've been debunking that as an example, the case from the, the state of Texas. This was the mother, you might be familiar with her. She was pregnant with her third child and discovered that her child had trisomy 18. So it was a, disor a genetic disorder. And because her baby would have potentially life-threatening disability, and, and maybe the baby could have lived. I mean, some babies with this condition, like Bella Santorum, live to be you know, 16, 17 years old, are still thriving. But it can be fatal for a lot of babies as well, both maybe before birth or during birth or after birth. And so what Kate Cox insisted was that she be given a late-term abortion in the state of Texas. And Texas, she wanted to ultimately give a lethal injection to her baby with disabilities because she didn't want to give birth to this baby. And the state of Texas said, no, we're a pro-life state. We're not going to do that. So Kate Cox tries to sue the state. The state refused to uh, back down. Obviously, this is a human life. You don't just get to kill your baby because they have a disability. And so what did Kate Cox do? She went out of state for a lethal procedure to end the life of her living baby. And this was done in the name of compassion. So these are the kinds of stories that are trotted out by the pro-abortion narrative. And they're always putting the empathy and the compassion on the side of this poor mother who has to deal with a you know, baby who's sick or a baby who's disabled. And there's never a shred of consideration. There's never a shred of consideration for the little baby that's being sometimes dismembered alive in an abortion procedure that they're so zealously defending. That's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with these stories. You never are told the story of the baby who's at risk of being killed via a violent abortion. It's always this smoke and mirrors presentation of how women supposedly need this procedure when the reality is they don't. Let me unpack that a little more specifically with this Amber Thurman story. We're gonna go to some really important statistics that you need to know and some facts that you need to know about this particular case. All right, so we're gonna start. I, I love our live action news. You guys are familiar with it. If you know about live action, my organization, Live Action News has been doing a phenomenal job debunking some of these really terrible lies that are being told. So ProPublica, that very pro-abortion rag came out with this claim, this was just a few days ago, that a young mother is dead because of this pro-life law in the state of Georgia. And they went on to tell the story, the author was Kavitha Serana, tells a story about how pro-life laws are to blame for the deaths. And this woman who was Amber Thurman, she was a single mother, she had a six-year-old son, she was pregnant with twins. She had twin babies that she found out she was pregnant with. How she went out of state, out of Georgia, because Georgia has a, an abortion ban. They do not permit abortions. And she went out of state to North Carolina to go get ultimately the abortion pill. So she took the abortion pill, she went home, and she started to have serious complications. Now here's where the first lie from ProPublica comes in. ProPublica is blaming a pro-life law for her complications. Her complications were directly a consequence of taking the abortion pill. Amber Thurman ultimately ended up dying because she took abortion pills which killed her twins and then threatened and ultimately took her own life. This is not some random accident of what happened to Amber. Abortion pills at large in America, according to the latest data, land one out of every 25 women in the emergency room. So this is now 60% of all abortions. Abortion pills were under the Biden administration. The FDA lifted even more um, uh, controls and regulations off of abortion pills. They can now be delivered via mail. So you can just get your abortion pill in the mail, or you can, in this case of um, Amanda, you could, Amber, you could just drive to another state. And one out of every 25 women who are taking abortion pills end up in the emergency room because the complications are so severe. Why are the complications so severe? Well, the abortion pill regimen is two different pills. One of the pills is designed to starve the developing baby of nutrients, basically blocking the flow of 
estrogen of progesterone so that the baby no longer can attach the lining of the uterus and get the nutrients that he or she needs. And then the second abortion pill is used to ultimately force a labor of that baby, force a miscarriage. And so what happens sometimes is it doesn't complete the process of forcing the miscarriage. What happens is the baby is killed, the baby's dead, and instead of miscarrying that baby, the pill fails. And so the baby, the, the, the parts of this baby are left inside the mother. And the problem with this is it can lead to hemorrhaging or infection and can lead to death. In fact, women have died from the abortion pill. So it's, an, it's a horrible, uh, you know, everything about it is horrible and, and heartbreaking, right? Everything, every aspect of this. Heartbreaking for the lives of the babies that have been killed and are being killed by these pills. Heartbreaking for the mothers who choose this, sometimes out of ignorance, sometimes out of fear, uh, sometimes just out of the, the own darkness in our human heart. And choosing to take these pills, which can have such ser serious complications and sometimes life-threatening complications. So let's keep going back to Amber's story though. She comes back from North Carolina to her state of Georgia. She starts to bleed a lot. She's bleeding heavily. She's starting to have an infection and she ultimately goes, her body goes into septic shock. Now, ProPublica presents this as, well, they didn't provide her healthcare in Georgia because it's a pro-life state. But the reality is there is nothing in Georgia pro-life law that says that you cannot treat a miscarriage. You know, at this point, she's effectively having a, a miscarriage because she took the abortion pills and they particularly zeroed in and the, on the DNC procedure. Now, if you guys who are familiar with this and who kind of follow abortion um, politics and understand the abortion issue, understand that a DNC can be used in an abortion procedure to kill a developing baby. But DNCs can also be used in a miscarriage if the baby has already passed away and there's infection that may take place or it's a missed miscarriage, the baby hasn't passed yet to remove the baby, all right? I have a very close friend as an example recently who miscarried. She's hardcore pro-life and she was, it was devastating for her. And she ultimately got a DNC procedure because she what had miscarried. The baby had passed away and they used that to complete the miscarriage after waiting and monitoring the situation for a few weeks actually. This friend of, is pro-life. She did not have an abortion. Her baby had already passed away. She was not, there's nothing about ending the life of her baby, but the procedure was used in order to help her pass her baby. Now, some people still get confused about this. Well, it's the same procedure and you just want it, you, you're just making it illegal. No, it's, it, it's, it's similar to if you're doing, I think I've talked about this on the podcast before, I was talking about it recently in a media interview. If you are burying somebody and they're alive, you're taking a live person and you're burying them and you kill them that way, that's a murder. If you take a dead body, somebody who's passed away and you give them a proper burial, that's the proper treatment of a dead body. Similarly, it can be the proper treatment of a mis miscarriage when the baby has already passed away to so do a procedure to remove the baby. But if the baby is alive, this is what Georgia prohibits, right? Well, in the case of Amber, the babies had passed away. She had killed them via the abortion pill, the first pill that she took, and she just wasn't able to pass them. And so ProPublica claiming that it was Georgia's pro-life law that killed Amber is a complete and utter lie. And what's so tragic about this lie, guys, is that they're using Amber's death and the death of her twin babies as justification for saying, let's have abortion on demand in the state of Georgia. That's what they're doing. In fact, Kamala Harris, I want to pull up this tweet for you guys. Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States, came out recently. It was today, actually. I think it was this morning with this tweet. Let's pull this tweet up. She says, a young mother from Georgia should be alive today, raising her son and pursuing her dream of attending nursing school. This is exactly what we feared when Roe v. Wade was struck down. In more than 20 states, Trump abortion bans prevent doctors from providing basic medical care. This is a complete and utter lie. Georgia does not prohibit in any way, shape, or form. Georgia does not prohibit pro-life Georgia in any way, shape, or form using a DNC procedure in the case of a missed miscarriage. And in the case of a life-threatening medical emergency, 
In rare, rare, rare cases, early delivery of a baby may be necessary. And Georgia doesn't permit that, doesn't for, doesn't uh, re, um, forbid that either. That's the reality. Georgia has an incredibly um, important and, and valuable pro-life law that is protecting lives. And they're getting attacked because the abortion pill is lethal, not just for the baby, but sometimes for the mother. So the first fact that everyone needs to know about this case is that DNCs are not illegal in Georgia or in any pro-life state unless the DNC procedure is being used to intentionally kill a child, aka an elective abortion. That is what is illegal. If the DNC procedure is being used to kill somebody, it is wrong. The DNC procedure is used in a rare case of maybe a missed miscarriage to remove a baby who's already passed away, that is medical care. That distinction is incredibly important. Number two, fact check for this Amber story, for this Amber story is that sepsis, and this is ProPublica talking about how Amber underwent, endured sepsis that ultimately killed her. Sepsis is a known risk of the abortion pill. In fact, if you have, the, you, you see there's, the abortion pill comes with a black box warning, because the, abor the abortion pill is a lethal, dr a lethal drug, and the abortion pill, its black box, its own black box warning, indicates that this can be a deadly drug. Even though they're claiming, oh, this is safer than Tylenol, yada yada, no, it has a black box warning because the abortion pill can lead to sepsis, it can lead to infection that can be lethal for the mom. Number three, another fact to fact check the ProPublica hit piece against the Georgia pro-life law. ProPublica blaming pro-life laws is speculation, of course, because they're saying, well, the doctors were afraid to do a DNC because of the pro-life laws, and that's why they didn't do the DNC in enough time. There is zero evidence, and they show zero evidence in their own article, which is pretty lengthy, that the reason that doctors waited and didn't immediately do the DNC had anything to do with the pro-life law. The reason that the doctors in many of these cases will wait and see is because they're monitoring the pregnancy to see, do we need to go to a surgery? Because there are additional risks with surgery. That's often the reason for a wait and see approach. Now, I wasn't in the shoes of the healthcare folks who are treating Amber. I don't know how much care or lack of care she specifically received. I think in many of these cases, medical malpractice may come into play. There are t There's tons of that, unfortunately, happening in our country. Medical malpractice is a serious issue. And so there, this could be an element here. But of course, ProPublica doesn't want to blame medical malpractice. Again, ProPublica and Kamala Harris and other pro-abortion advocates want to blame pro-life laws. Finally, ProPublica, of course, and Kamala Harris, for that matter, is not being honest about Georgia's pro-life law. Georgia's pro-life law very clearly states that in a life-threatening medical emergency, early delivery may be necessary and can be permitted. And it also in no way prohibits using the DNC procedure in the case of a missed miscarriage. That is the reality. And in fact, there is no pro-life law in the country that prohibits treatment of an ectopic pregnancy or that says that you can't use a DNC in a case of a missed miscarriage. Those pro-life laws don't exist because Everybody who's pro-life understands the difference between removing a baby who's already passed away versus killing intentionally a living baby, or the difference in, a, in the case of an ectopic pregnancy, removing the baby from a hostile environment if the baby's developing in a fallopian tube, and the tragic death of that baby that wasn't the intention, right? That wasn't the goal to kill the baby, but to remove it from the hostile environment of the fallopian tube where it's implanted there instead of the uterus, and the baby can't grow or the baby's already dead or is dying, and the mother could have a life-threatening complication because there could be a rupture, that has never been prohibited by any pro-life law in the books in this country. So these are the facts that people need to know. I'm going to run through them one more time so you guys can use these when you're maybe on social media talking with friends and whatever your, you know, your place of influence is. DNCs are not illegal in Georgia unless they're being used to kill a baby. That's the fact of Georgia's law. Sepsis is a known risk of the abortion pill. There have been other people who have died from the abortion pill because of complications like sepsis. That's why Amber passed away. ProPublica blaming pro-life laws and doc doctors 
because of the pro-life law is complete speculation. There's zero evidence to show that the doctors didn't give her the DNC because of anything to do with pro-life law. Often in these cases, I think medical negligence or failure to properly understand what was going on with the patient can be part of the reason that treatment wasn't given in the right on the right course. And then finally, ProPublica is outright lying about Georgia's pro-life law, as is Kamala Harris and many other abortion advocates who are using tragic stories like this one to advocate for abortion on demand. I want to pull up a video for you guys to hear of another story. This is the story of a young woman who was killed, one of the first young women in America who was killed by the legal abortion pill. So this was back, I think, in the late 90s, might be the early 2000s, when the abortion pill was first legalized. So in the 90s is when it was legalized first by then President Bill Clinton. The history of the abortion pill, of course, is a lengthy one. We're not going to get into all of that today. But what I can say, what I will say, is that Bill Clinton was the one who ultimately fast-tracked its authorization. So his FDA fast-tracked the authorization of the abortion pill, even though it didn't go through any kind of proper clinical trial process. And once the abortion pill was on the market, it started to grow in popularity in, in, the, in the use of killing babies, and it started to claim the lives of women too and girls. So we're going to watch a video here of the story of one of these young women, the first young women in America who was killed by the abortion pill, by the legal abortion pill. And this is her father, her distraught father, talking about what happened to her. This is the story of Holly. 18th birthday on September 10th, 2003, she walked into a Planned Parenthood clinic to be administered an RU46 medical abortion regimen. By the fourth day, she was admitted to the emergency room of a local hospital. She was examined. She was given painkillers. She complained of bleeding, cramping, constipation, and pain. But subsequently, she was sent home. Seven days after taking RU46, Holly returned to the same emergency room hospital complaining of weakness, vomiting, abdominal pain. Hours later, I was called to the hospital where I found her surrounded by doctors and nurses, barely conscious and struggling to breathe. Holly was so weak she could barely hold on to my hand. Feeling utter disbelief and desperation, I watched Holly succumb to a massive bacterial infection as a result of a drug-induced abortion with RU46. With the support of my family and friends, I've spent thousands of hours researching medical and scientific journals, talking to doctors, legislators, state and federal agencies, and to learn about the drug RU46, otherwise known as Mifepristone. I believe that RU46 is the substantial contributing factor responsible for Holly's death. Currently, there have been eight deaths reported by the FDA linked with the drug. Furthermore, there are 900 or more serious health consequences associated with RU46. How many must die needlessly before this drug is removed from the market? Women have been and are still relying upon what they think is truthful information concerning the limited risk involved with a medical abortion. Yet, does the average patient, a teenager like Holly, understand she may be risking her life taking RU46 when she's re repeatedly exposed to statements like, it's what women have wanted for years. It's the first FDA-approved pill providing women with a safe and effective non-surgical option for ending early pregnancy. There are no quick fixes or magical pills to make an unplanned pregnancy go away. My family, friends, and community were deeply saddened and are forever marred by Holly's preventable and tragic death. It is my vibrant memory of Holly and her premature death that have inspired me to make the public aware of the serious and lethal effects of the RU46 regimen. Not a day goes by that I do not recall her brilliant blue eyes, engaging smile, laughter, and sheer gentle beauty. Holly's personal drive and unwavering determination continue to inspire me and give me strength to pursue these critical issues in her name. I mean, his story is so gut-wrenching, this father. He's so distraught because he lost his daughter, of course, because of the abortion pill, because of RU486 or Mifepristone. And he's testifying right here about 
the experience and he's saying these pills are dangerous. Why are no one, why is no one being told this, right? Well, because the very advocates who claim to speak for women and for women's health are lying. They're not telling you the truth. They're not telling women the truth. They're not telling us the facts about the risks of RU-486, the thousands of women who have gone to emergency rooms because of RU-486, the abortion pill. That's not headline news. That's not in any way a story that we hear. What we hear is headline news when somebody like Amber passes away, tragically. And then her death is weaponized not to expose the evil of the abortion pill, but her death is weaponized by abortion advocates to say, we want more abortion pills. How dare Georgia not give all of its women abortion pills? How dare Georgia protect the lives of innocent babies? And look, guys, when I think about this, I also think about the fact that we can do so much better as women than abortion, that we living in a society that tells us that the solution to unexpected pregnancy, the solution to pregnancy complications is to kill the baby. What a brutal society to live in. We've got to do better than that. And I think women are stronger and more capable than we sometimes make them out to be. And human beings, the human spirit has more possibility, has more power than we give it. And so when we say to women, you need abortion, you need abortion, you need abortion, I think it's infantilizing of women. And I think that Part of the solution here is to work to connect women in need, families in need with the resources that they need, because there's thousands of pregnancy resource centers and resources out there, but it's really also an information campaign. You know, we have thousands of pregnancy centers. We have thousands of resources out there. Some of them go a full day and they only get a couple visits. They don't have enough people even showing up at the door to get all of the free resources, the counseling, the prenatal care, the parenting classes, the resources, the, the diapers, the, the clothes, the material support, the housing support that they may have to offer. They have a lot to offer. But when we have it ingrained in our minds, in our society, that if I get pregnant, I should just have an abortion, right? If that's, if that's the go-to, that I should have an abortion because that's the right thing for me to do, the smart thing for me to do, then we can have all the resources in the world and they won't matter, right? So, so much of our pro-life movement has to be to speak the truth and to educate people about what abortion actually is and to educate people about why we need abortion laws to prohibit abortion. If North Carolina had abortion illegal, as Georgia did, Amber would not have drove there to get these abortion pills. She likely would not have taken the abortion pills. Imagine if we put all of our fire and our fuel and our money you know, and Kamala Harris, instead of using her platform to promote abortion, she used it to promote supporting mothers and saying, we've got to do better for moms and kids. Imagine how transformational that would be, how many lives that that would save, right? That's what we've got to work towards. I want to address something else here, which is this mythology now that's developing that somehow abortion is healthcare, right? And we need abortion for medical emergencies, when the reality is the countries, some of the countries with the best pro-life laws have the lowest maternal mortality rates in the world. This is really interesting data that I wanted to share with you guys. Did you know, as an example, and we're going to show this chart here in a minute, the country of Malta has one of the lowest maternal mortality rates in the world. Malta is a fully pro-life country, so they do not permit any abortion. And they have not had a single maternal death in 12 years. All right, check out this chart. Let me see. Let me know if you guys can see this. This is really incredible. So this is a chart through the year 2020 from the year 2000. So 20 years of maternal mortality rates. So your maternal mortality rate as a country, as you guys probably know, is how many women basically are dying who are pregnant, whether it's from birth or pregnancy. And what's so incredible about this maternal mortality ratio, this is a modeled estimate, so for every 100,000 live births, so it's taking into account the size of populations, et cetera, you can see the top line here is China, okay, this red line, an extremely high maternal mortality rate. It's gone down over the last 20 years, but it's still very high. Who's up there with China in terms of having an extremely high maternal mortality rate? And China, by the way, as you guys know, is abortion on demand and and in many ways, coerced abortion. Who else has the sky high maternal mortality rate? The United States. 
Who has a lower maternal mortality rate than the United States? The UK is lower than us, but even lower than the UK are three countries who have been very pro-life. Two of them are still strongly pro-life and one of them in just recent years has faltered, but before that it was strongly pro-life and their maternal mortality rates were some of the best in the world. Those countries include Ireland, Malta, and Poland. Malta, I already mentioned, has not had a maternal death in 12 years. Ireland had a complete abortion ban for decades until just a few years ago. But you see for the 20 years of 2000 to 2020, how low their maternal mortality rate was. They didn't need abortion for women's health care in Ireland. They don't need abortion for women's health care in Malta. Those are some of the healthiest populations and the safest places to have a baby. There's no abortion. There was no abortion or in Ireland and there is no abortion in Malta. But the United States with our 1 million abortions a year, we're killing more women who are pregnant than any of these other countries on this graph, except for China. So when you look at a holistic view of what does a healthcare system look like that is actually gonna help women and lead to better outcomes for women, it does not include abortion. So this is the big lie, right? This is the big scam of media today. The big scam of media today is that you need abortion, that it's that killing a baby is somehow healthcare. When thousands of OBGYNs agree abortion is not healthcare, it's not, ne it's not needed in a medical setting. And when we know the truth that abortion is actually the intentional destruction of an innocent human life, that's what an abortion is. And it's never medically necessary. It is just, honestly, it's just heartbreaking and it should lead us to, I think, a righteous indignation that these lies are just told incessantly. And I do think sometimes, guys, that, listen, I, I do think that sometimes because the lies are so incessant and they make it, they make anyone who opposes the lie to be like the outcast. You, you are so crazy to be pro-life. You are so crazy to want an abortion ban. How could you? You're like, it's such a tiny minority. And that narrative is so pernicious because it tells you the lie again and again and again until people think it's true. And then it gaslights the person who's speaking the truth to the lie and saying, how dare you even think that? How dare you even say that? And the only way to deal with those sorts of bullies, because that's that's a, that's like a bully on the playground who's saying the sky is red, the sky is red, the sky is red. And if you dare say anything, you are stupid and I'm going to punch you in the face, right? That's the, that's the idea here, right? The only solution to this is to stand up to the bully and to never back down and to say, no, what is true is true. Abortion is not health care. Abortion is the killing of an innocent human being. And I'm going to oppose it no matter what. And guess what? A lot more people would even agree with me or have the courage to agree with me if they see me standing up to the bully. That's what this is. The other part that's so pernicious here, it's so deceptive, is that the bully who's saying, the sky is red, the sky is red, the sky is red, right? That's pro-abortion bully is also saying, and I'm the one who cares for women, not you, right? That's, that's the pro-publica lie. That's the Kamala Harris lie. Well, I care about women and you don't care. You hate women. This is a complete lie, as you know. The pro-life path is the only pro-woman path. It is the pro-child path. Women's health care is better served when abortion is off the table. That's proven by maternal mortality rates being better in pro-life countries. And it's proven by the testimonies of thousands of medical professionals who attest to that. Women's health care is better without abortion. And of course, babies <laughs> are better off without abortion. They're not dismembered and killed by abortion. We've got to say these things again and again, guys. And I just want to, I'm so grateful there are many of you speaking out about this and I want to encourage you to keep doing it because the more you speak, the easier it will be for other people to speak to and for other people to not just listen and believe the incessant lies coming from media groups and coming from even some of the highest offices in the, in the country, like our you know, the Vice President Harris, who's running to be president of the United States. So we've got to keep on pushing back against the lives. I, you know, my heart goes out to Amber for the loss of her life, the loss of her twin's life, for, for her six-year-old son that she left behind, 
Imagine if we lived in a society instead that never thought of abortion even as an option. It was it was just a seen as a as a horrible and dangerous thing that should not be considered. Amber would be alive. Amber would be alive and her twins would be alive. That's the society we need to fight for for her sake, for the sake of her for her twins that we've lost. Listen, abortion bans don't just save the lives of babies. Abortion bans save the lives of women too. They save the lives of people that are being tricked into believing that killing a baby is somehow healthcare and it's gonna somehow help them get ahead when it can never do either of those things. It can never actually heal and it can never actually help you get ahead in any meaningful way. Because the most important thing at the end of the day is not how wealthy I am or how many opportunities are ha I have or how many things I get to do because I'm not shackled with a baby, right? This is the mentality, but it's about relationships and it's about love. That ultimately is the path to the deepest human meaning and experience, not all the material things that people are sometimes tempted to or people sometimes want to prioritize. So I hope for future Ambers out there that our movement can get through to them, that we can be there to be the resources and the support that's needed because that support is out there and that we can put in place the abortion bans in every state to stop the killing and to instead move healthcare to focus on loving and serving both mother and baby and not pitting mother against baby. All right, I'm gonna take a look at the chat. We, gotta, we still have to cover the Ted Cruz bill that was recently uh, the competing bills between Cruz and the Democrats. Um, thanks everybody again for joining the chat. Rachel, thanks for joining. Rachel says, I can't believe they're misinforming people about her death for political weaponry. It's very devastating. Brooke is saying women deserve better OB care. A hundred percent, that is exactly it. Um, Loli Valento is saying the clinic that she got the pills from wouldn't have helped her. They would have sent her to an ER exactly where she went. That's true, by the way. That is the, that the, the reality is most of these abortion clinics, they're not prepared to deal with serious complications from the abortions that they do. So they'll call the ER if there's an, an emergency situation at their clinic, or they'll wait to call the ER because they don't want to have the sirens running outside their building and scare off potential clients, or they'll send the woman home. And she'll have to call the ER, but they're not set up to deal with high risk situations. And these are abortion clinics. Planned Parenthood is not dealing with high risk situations. They're going to send you to a hospital for that. So that's why so many women show up at the ER. One out of every 25 women who take an abortion pill will show up at the emergency room. That's because this is a deadly, deadly drug. Um, Danielle says, thank you for speaking the truth. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you for listening. All right. We are going to go over to the story we're following here on IVF legislation. We just did a podcast on this, as you guys may have listened to it, with Dr. Lauren Rubal. It was really insightful. She had a lot to say about the Trump-Vance policy proposal on IVF. So you guys probably have already heard this, but President Trump proposed a few weeks ago, taxpayer-funded IVF for all people. Pretty insane policy proposal, especially considering that this goes against not just the conscience protections of everyday Americans, because IVF involves highly dangerous and unethical technology that leads to the death of 93% of the babies that are created via IVF, but it also goes against the beliefs of many Americans, this approach to uh, fertility technology. And in addition, you're talking up to $60,000 per live birth that IVF costs. So this is an incredible amount of money and the American, our, our American culture is the wild west of the IVF industry. We don't have any regulations. You can create a dozen babies. You can create two dozen babies. You can sex select the baby you want. You can indefinitely freeze your babies in the United States. You can be a single man and get a baby. You can be two gay men and get a baby. It doesn't matter. You can just get a baby. You can create a baby using this technology without any of the natural order in place and the natural protections of the natural order in place. And by that, I mean, there's natural protections in place with the natural way that life comes into being, right? Meaning when I'm pregnant, naturally, there's a whole a series of hormones and interplay to create a sense of protectiveness for that baby. If that baby is born, a sense of protectiveness for that baby 
Of course, women, I think, have a natural protectiveness. Men also have it, but it's it's a different kind. There's a lot of science behind why there's bonds are so beautiful and natural between mother and baby, between baby and parents. And IVF not only recklessly treats the lives of millions of babies, there's a million baby babies frozen right now via IVF, but it also breaks all of those natural bonds. So we have these horror stories of people like the two men in California who created in test tubes little babies, had a little baby boy implanted in a surrogate. These were two men living in a same-sex relationship, and the baby was 20 weeks old. The surrogate, this is a woman named Brittany in California, found out she had early-stage breast cancer. She wanted to get cancer treatment, so she wanted to do an early delivery of the baby, but still let the baby survive, of course, this little boy. And the two dads said, we don't want our genetic material out there. We want you to kill the baby. We want you to abort this 20-week-old baby. And that's what happened to him. This little boy was created in a in vitro fertilization clinic with probably multiple other siblings, genetic siblings, who are either destroyed or frozen indefinitely. He was chosen to be implanted in the womb of a woman who didn't know him from Adam was paid money for this. She gestated that little boy till he was 20 weeks old. He could feel pain. He could move. He had all of his you know, fingers and toes, his beautiful eyes and face and eyelashes. And his dads decided they didn't want him anymore. And so they ordered his death and they achieved his death. He was killed in my state. This is legal, guys. This is the IVF industry. So of course there should be an outcry against a government-funded proposal to force, to mandate insurance companies and taxpayers to fund this for anybody and everybody. And that is where the blowback lies, right? But I just want to look at what has happened here with this legislation, because you guys should know this isn't just the Trump fans ticket doing this. This is this weird uh, the focus of some Republicans now to push for IVF. I think they're trying to find something that's going to be maybe populist and win amongst the voters. I don't know what the the, the focus here is exactly politically, the, the strategy, but this is not a smart strategy, first of all, because this has serious ethical complications with it that are upsetting a lot of potential voters. But it's also very short-sighted because if you want to make America a healthier place for families and address infertility, you would actually pursue and invest in restorative fertility treatments that address the root causes of infertility and work with the body naturally to achieve pregnancy instead of using this unethical and dangerous technology of IVF. And that technology, by the way, restorative approaches to fertility, and we talked about this with Dr. Rubal in the podcast in the episode that came out yesterday, the restorative approach to fertility has as good outcomes in achieving a live birth in, in many studies as IVF. And it's dramatically less expensive. Usually the average cost for these restorative approaches are between maybe two or $5,000. IVF can be up to $60,000 to achieve one live birth. So she shared some really incredible information. Go back and check out that episode if you can. But what is, what is happening here with this IVF legislation? So right now, the Democrats had a IVF bill out, and they wanted to, again, do IVF, tax-funded, mandated, everything else. Um, Ted Cruz, Senator Ted Cruz responded with his own, and, and Senator Kate Britt from Alabama responded with their own IVF bill. So let's pull this article up from The Hill explaining what happened here. It says Democrats on Tuesday blocked an attempt by Republican Senators Ted Cruz and Katie Britt to pass a GOP in vitro fertilization access bill through unanimous consent. The fact that the GOP is doing a IVF access bill is absolutely crazy. This is insane. This would have not even have been considered two years ago. I think this is the Trump influence in the party because Trump gutted the RNC platform on life and then added in birth control and added in IVF. Very ethically problematic procedures and approaches that actually lead to more abortions. Um, but the article goes on to share that, um, you know, Ted Cruz blasted the vote as a show vote. Yes, this is all show votes, by the way. These are show votes for and against IVF because this has now become this partisan issue and this this fight to say, well, I care about women more than you. 
That's what's going on between the Republicans and the Democrats here. When the reality is IVF is not caring about women. If you want to address the fertility crisis in America, IVF is not the way. IVF is incredibly painful. It's incredibly expensive. It leads to the deaths of 93% of the babies that it creates or the indefinite freezing. It is not the way, guys. Um, of course, any baby conceived via IVF is an incredible gift. And that's why this is a problem because we know IVF creates life. And so we need to have standards for how we do this and, and protect the babies that are created. So anyways, it goes on the, the um, you know, Cruz is, uh, he's obviously criticizing the Republicans. They're all, they're all criticizing each other. This is the the, this is the distinction between the bills. The GOP bill would bar states from receiving Medicaid funding if they implement a ban on IVF, but explicitly does not guarantee a right to IVF services. So the Cruz bill and the Brit bill does not go as far as what President Trump is asking them to do, because President Trump wants it to be paid for by the taxpayer 100%, right? They're saying that you actually won't get Medicaid money if you stop IVF in your state. So if a pro-life state wanted to regulate IVF in a way that would prohibit it from being done because of the cost it is to human lives, that state now, because of Republicans in this case, would not be able to get Medicaid money. I mean, how did we get here that the Republicans are doing this? This is so off kilter. This is wrong, right? Uh, it's obviously more extreme what the Democrats are pushing for here. They're now doing what Trump wants, which is guaranteeing a right to IVF. So President Trump is to the left here, you know, even of his own GOP in the Senate anyways, and what they're pushing in the Senate. But it's all very problematic. And, and, and I think it's ignorance. I mean, a lot of this, I think, is people, people want to address infertility. People want to solve the problem of infertility. And I understand that. We should solve that. It is a heart-wrenching, rising challenge for many people in this country. Infertility is heart-wrenching. But the answer to infertility is not IVF. The answer to, to infertility is addressing root causes, is working in a restorative approach to really help couples and families be able to have children. And in those cases where it is impossible for whatever reason, that's where I think we need to celebrate and uphold the beautiful gift that adoption can be. Because keep in mind that 1 million children aborted every year, a million children aborted every year. Imagine if instead of creating all of these precious new lives via IVF and freezing million of them indefinitely and many of them getting destroyed, we instead stop abortions and that a million children a year that are killed in abortion are instead loved and welcomed, their mothers supported, and they're placed in loving homes. Imagine if that was the solution to the fertility crisis instead of the approach that we're taking, which is so wasteful and dangerous to human life. I think it would be a great solution. I think that's what our uh, lawmakers should focus on, restorative approaches and helping women who are pregnant and if they can't parent for whatever reason, aiding the adoption process to support that birth mother as well as the adoptive families. That is the solution. That is what we should be aiming towards. All right, guys, thank you so much. I know that was a lot to cover here. I think it's so important that we fact check and deep dive these stories. Thank you guys for listening. Um, thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Pat, for joining. Um, thank you, Angela, for joining. Again, I love you guys. Thank you for joining on the chat and thank you for joining over at YouTube Live. We will be on YouTube Live again soon. I love doing these. We're gonna continue to do them on the channel. And don't forget that you can continue to find episodes of the Lila Rose podcast both on YouTube as well as on podcast app. Make sure that you are subscribed both places. All right, thanks so much, guys, and we will see you next time.